on this launch going to plan, of course, you know, um, and we've seen, we've already had a delay. In fact, we've talked about the delay with the Artemis project for quite some years now. We're looking at, once this Artemis 1 is launched, we're then looking at just a couple of years before we can get the Artemis 2 spacecraft up with people actually on board and actually orbiting around the moon. I wouldn't want to be those astronauts who've got to go all the way to the moon and then actually not land. That would be <laughs> terrible, wouldn't it? So we're looking at a couple of Is it of Michael years. Collins who did that on the Michael first? Michael Collins on the... Ah, oh, could you feel I felt for the poor <laughs> child? I wasn't even around then, but I felt for him still. So it's a couple of years, probably 2024, with a, you know, with a fair wind that will get people orbiting around the moon. And then as soon as 2025, where we could be looking to get people to land on the surface of the moon. The Orion module, the, the human element of the Artemis mission, still being worked upon. Um, and, of course, getting people in space is all about food and water mm. and air to breathe. Um, and all those sort of technologies have got to be worked upon. So that's still in progress. And part of this mission that we're trying to see, the Artemis 1 mission, is about developing that technology and testing that technology for that to happen. So we're looking at maybe, you know, five years to get people back on the moon and then the grander scale goal for the Artemis project is to get a gateway around the moon, an orbiting station around the moon, then a, a, a permanent base on the moon of some sort and ultimately trips to Mars. I mean, it does sound like the fa most fantastic sort of science fiction. But when we look at this in the round, I suppose none of it is easy. It's all very difficult, but it's interesting that we have landed, or at least the Chinese have landed rovers on the moon, remote rovers. The Americans have landed remote rovers on Mars. I suppose the really tricky thing is getting... Uh, we, we can get things to these celestial bodies pretty easily. It's getting them back up and out again. It's, it's that, but it's also about getting humans there. You know, if you've got to go to the moon, it's two or three days' journey. That's, so you can manage that. If you want to go to Mars, it's upwards or up to about six months to get there, you might have to stay on the surface of Mars for about six months and then possibly another six months to come home again. Now, psychologically, that is incredibly difficult. You've just got to imagine being cooped up in a fairly small house with three or four people mm. for six months, maybe 18 months. That takes a lot of psychological challenges. So with the big problems of deep space exploration as well, we've stayed within low Earth orbit for most of the time that we've had people up in space, protected by the Earth's magnetic field. We don't really know the consequences of solar flares, of radioactivity uh, on the human body out there in deep space, away from the protection of the Earth. I suppose that's going to be a big challenge as well. It is, and one of the wonderful things that NASA are doing, they've got these people, they're not people, they're munikins, they've called them, which are just, <laughs> well, they must have been a PR company, hundreds of thousands of dollars to come up with that but they're, they're basically mannequins um, which are dressed in a new type of spacesuit which they've got sensors all over the bodies to see what kind of radiation they're going to experience what kind of vibrations and other environmental conditions that those um, astronauts will experience on that trip to the moon because the trip's going to be uh, out near them on the Artemis project the Orion uh, module will be at the moon for at least a couple of weeks so it's going to be interesting to see how that actually does uh, affect a human body. It's remarkable. We're going to be getting so much real-world data. And I suppose, crucially, different from any other moon mission that we've seen before, HD camera video what? footage. And this is going to be the most extraordinary thing. Even, even from this launch uh, today, or, well, potentially later this week, if it goes all to plan, this is going to be the first time that we get some of the most high-quality footage of... Uh, of, of any celestial body, really. I suppose not as good as sending a person there with a camera, but a mi miles and miles away from the early 1970s. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have had, as you said, we've had the Chinese have sent craft to the moon, so we have had some incredibly high-resolution images of the moon and of Mars. So, you know, we've, we've, we've got a lot of good data, but what we've not got is human experience. Mm. Um, but, you know, picking up on what you said about high-resolution, just seeing the, the pictures from the launch site today... The quality of that was just incredible compared to the Apollo mission when you had a very grainy sort of image of the Saturn V as it was launching. And that footage is incredible in itself, but to get high definition of the rocket launching, I'm just looking forward to that alone. It's going to be incredible.